This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetisy. I'm Bridget Fetisy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. Support for Walk-In's Welcome comes from Manscaped, who is number one in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your man's family jewels. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Do your ladies a favor. Hit manscaped.com up and use the code WALKIN. They'll thank you. This week, I'm excited to have Megan Dom. Megan Dom is the author of The Problem with Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars, which was a 2019 New York Times notable book. A columnist for the Los Angeles Times from 2005 to 2016, she now writes a bi-weekly column for Medium's Gen Magazine. Megan and I are culture war sisters in the battles in the crossfire. I think we were both Gen Xers caught in the crossfire. So there's a lot of overlap in our story and she's just very insightful. So enjoy. I'm with Megan Dom, everyone. Hello. Hi. This is the first time you? I've ever done the, this is the first time I've done back to back. Yeah. I've never had the the marathon switch, the switcheroo. Well. We're going to have all new material. I know. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to have you. I read, I often have people on and don't have a chance to read their book. And I'm so excited I got to read yours before you came I'm on. I'm so honored that you read it. I a read lot of it people and, don't even fake it. They just say, I didn't, I haven't read a word. Oh, of your I'll book. be honest if I haven't <laughs> read someone's book. But I, I read it in like three days. It's so good. I couldn't put it down. Oh, but also, you. it's so similar we're kind of in the same generation a little bit and i think i'm i think i'm an exennial i don't oh. know technically i think i'm on the the border you're an xm millennial yeah you're like a, like a satellite radio millennial. oh that's interesting because the gen the the generation beneath millennials and before gen z are zillennials oh okay so you're an x exennial or something all right. Well, you so, have the soul of a Gen Xer. I don't feel related to millennials no, at all. No. No, I don't identify as a millennial. Yeah. It's how <laughs> you can identify however you wish. Yes. I'm, I'm a Gen Z. So I loved how it sounds like it was hard to write, though. The it was book. So hard to write. Tell us about your book. Oh, my gosh. Uh, the Problem with Everything My Journey Through the New Culture Wars. Uh, it's sort of an intellectual memoir. I guess you might put it that way. Um, it is, it's about this moment that we've found ourselves in mm -hmm. and about sort of my own cognitive dissonance as a liberal, as a feminist, and I still identify as both of those things. Um, but the way that, that the conversation started to change around 2014, 2015, and there was sort of a gulf between, uh, what I, what I thought I was supposed to think and feel about certain issues, issues around feminism, issues around, free speech, just sort of, you know, the state of the arts and comedy and all that. Uh, there was a gulf between what I thought I was supposed to feel and what I actually felt. And so I wanted to talk about that. But I also didn't want to just like, be on about trigger warnings and snowflakes and right. all that sort of thing. I wanted to kind of go beyond that and think about why it was that I was feeling alienated. And were there certain things about growing up when I did that informed my sensibility in a way that was uh, making me perhaps less receptive to some of the ideas that we're circulating around now. So, so really, it's the book is a self interrogation. Interesting. Um, it's not, it, it, you know, it, I, I am sort of ranting and raving in places for sure, but ultimately, um, it's it's just a, a self inquiry um, uh, about these issues rather than just a an indictment of everybody else as and much as I feel that way sometimes it's hard because it seems like what I really identified with in your book was that internal struggle of trying to figure out where you land in a lot of the new liberal versus old liberal right 
ideology. More progressive, I guess, versus liberal now. We're supposed Are to say. Are they even compatible, do you think? Do you think that progressivism well, and classic liberalism are compatible it's so weird because i hate to think that i would be against progress and you know classical liberal is something that's uh, you know was historically defined as being on uh, on the right or at least on the conservative side i guess i just i'm i kind of just take everything on a case-by-case basis and i don't think that should be like a radical stance no it shouldn't be you know look at what's going on and you know i may feel one way about something else and maybe that's like pretty far on the left and a different way about another thing that might put me on the right so um I, I don't think these categories are, are very useful. No, that's why I identify as an independent now. Yeah. Because I don't, I can't really get on board with all things liberal. And I definitely am not a conservative by any means. Right. Although <laughs> conservatives aren't conservatives anymore. I right. mean, in a way, you know, Everyone's I think it's, an like, independent. it's like Barack Obama is, many are now considering a conservative. Yeah, I know. They also said that he was like a white boomer. <laughs> <laughs> in a recent op-ed like he was that he was like a white conservative boomer yeah because he said that the kids the the victimhood culture isn't going to get you very far or the right the finger pointing right so i guess that white white boomer is a state of mind i suppose apparently the if you dare to tell that's the 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 interesting thing that i can't reconcile is no matter what generation you're from, if you dare to suggest that someone take personal responsibility for something, you're basically a boomer. <laughs> They're like, okay, boomer. Which is hilarious because the boomers don't take were responsibility. Not, were, are not famous anything. for that yeah. in, in any way. And still aren't. <laughs> right. Yeah, taking personal responsibility, that's like a conservative, uh, that was always sort of like a conservative trope. You know, I kind of now I'm starting to think about it less like, you know, are you a liberal? Are you conserv- Are you conservative? Like this, you know, I am a liberal, but I, I definitely have a conservative kind of personality. Mm. Like I have a conservative temperament. I, I'm very... What do you mean by that? Well, I just... I mean, some of this I'm not proud of. Like, I'm not the most adventurous. Yeah. Like, I don't, I, I certainly take a lot of risks in some ways, um, you know, in terms of my career, like in terms of kind of the way I live, you know, financially or creatively or just, you know, in terms of how I have decided to live my life. But when it, in, in other ways, I'm just very risk averse. And I, I really just think people should kind of like, button up and stand up straight and shut up and where just... where are you from <laughs> from uh i grew up mostly in new jersey okay really but really so but basic and boring yeah. although yeah my parents are from you know they would say they're from the midwest but they're actually from like the southern midwest so my parents are from this really sort of un misunderstood or not even misunderstood just like not thought about part of the country which is southern illinois Mm -hmm. and downstate illinois which is really the south um more than the midwest Mm. so uh yeah they're from they're from there and they you know very modest backgrounds Uh, my father grew up actually quite poor and they they managed to pull themselves out of that realm through academia in certain ways, although they're not academics. But um, yeah, no, my parents were very um, sort of class obsessed. Yeah. uh, And that certainly informed me. Like I'm very, I'm really interested in like the sort of trappings of social class. Uh. And, and, you know, we we didn't have a lot of money, but, um, you know, certainly compared, you know, they came very far considering where they came from. Right. Uh, And they were definitely like acutely aware of, what it meant to be classy, uh, especially my mother. I'm not going to lay this at my father's feet, but especially, <laughs> especially my mother. So that's so interesting. Yeah. How I, are we all just reacting all the time to our? I, I have to ask upbringing. myself that. Like, right? Does anything you accomplish does it does it matter if you're just doing it because you're mad at your parents? Yeah. <laughs> Although someone said to me, like, like you know, does it matter? Like, okay, like you know, Einstein came up with e equals mc squared. Like, who ca- if he was mad at his father and that's why he came up with it? Who cares? <laughs> does it cancel it out? No, it doesn't cancel it out. 
I think so much of the world has been built on the back of sp- I'll show you. Yeah. And spite. which is a healthy thing. Yeah, it's a healthy way to direct it. Yeah. It's definitely the whole podcast this the theme of this podcast is grit and resilience mm-hmm. because I find that one of the trappings of the space that we're in is that you end up talking about victimhood culture but sounding quite a lot like a victim right it's it's hard to avoid i and so i prefer to hear all of the stories of grit and resilience from people what moment in your life has required the most resilience oh, or wow. moments that's a good question um you know it's nothing it's nothing too dramatic i mean i guess the most resilience. I mean, my mother died a really brutal death um, sorry. of cancer. Uh, and it was just, you know, we had a, a very we, pretty strained relationship anyway. So there was like this strange dichotomy of, of having to deal with these very real physical effects. Mm-hmm. Like she died, she had a, you know, all I can say is if you're going to get cancer, do not get a gastrointestinal cancer. It's just br- brutal. Mm. It's very, very rare cancer. Um, and so... You know, we were dealing with a lot of actual facts on the ground, terrible things happening. But then there were all these like psychological uh, maneuverings going on in, in my brain just because mm-hmm. I felt I felt like I had to sort of go through the motions of being a good daughter. And like I didn't take care of her all by myself, but I was certainly th- around a lot. Um, so there was this there was this um, feeling of having to like actually show up. Uh, show up for her and for the situation and really look at like terrible, terrible physical realities that were taking place. But at the same time, trying to act as if yeah, and just sort of do do my part yeah. and, and play the part, which is also what she really needed me to do. Yeah. And a lot of my growing up was actually performing in a way that my mother needed me to perform. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that would be an example of grit but it was an example of just sort of like holding my nose and, mm-hmm. and marching forward. I, Definitely. It's, yeah, it's funny. I don't ever think of myself as like, as gritty. I think of myself as able to compartmentalize my feelings. Mm. So maybe that's some version of it. That's interesting because you said in your book too, you mentioned that you felt like you were acting as if you were a student or performing yeah. being a student. I have this experience a lot. I don't know that I wonder if it's the writer sometimes in me. Mm. Like there's always a, a narrator. There's an observer that I do feel I can, I, I don't even realize that I'm doing it. I've had people pointed out where it's like, where'd you go? And it's like, I, I retreated, but I feel like recently when I was um, really depressed, I felt like I was the person impersonating Bridget. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I, I think that that can be, uh, it can be sort of cognitively upsetting, but in a way, I think it's a coping mechanism. Like, right. I think it's like a sign, it's sort of a sign of <laughs> mental instability, but also like extreme mental health. Like, sometimes yeah. you just have to get through it. My therapist would call it dissociating, I think. <laughs> but, that, but in a bad way, I guess. I mean, I mean, probably and not in a necessarily a bad way, but in that in uh, you do what you have to do at, at the time right. to get through circumstances like when right. your mother is dying yes. in real time, you can't be necessarily fully present for all of no. the emotions that are coming up in you so that you can be of service to her. Exactly. exactly. So you have to kind of detach yeah. to a certain event or dissociate from that experience. Right, right. But I, I do feel that as a writer, I do it more often and more it comes very naturally Hmm. well there's definitely a thing that happens where something's going on and you're like oh my god this is going to be a great story yeah like i don't this is this is so miserable what's happening right now and terrible but it's i'm kind of happy because it's going to be amazing it's going to be really easy to write yeah (laughs) that's the that's the writer's curse yeah Um, do you feel guilty oh i feel guilty about everything all the time were you catholic no oh but i just now I everything is like I, I I just obsess about what I did wrong and it just spirals and spirals and like were you uh, always like that? Yeah, I think so. And I are think, you the oldest? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, there was definitely I think um, my my mother. I mean, it's I, you know I wrote about her um, not in this book but in 
one of my previous books. And, you know, she was a, she was an interesting character because she just had many, she, she didn't, I don't want to say she didn't have a core self because that's like too going too far, but she just, she was, she, you would never really, really tell what was the real her. Like mm. she was, there was a sense of putting on airs and um, she really, really needed her children to be extensions of her mm. and so to not do what she wanted was like hurting her uh-huh, <laughs> like actually uh-huh. like like hurting her arm or something because yeah, yeah. we were her arm uh so it was uh, you know there they're definitely i was on a very short leash mm-hmm. um so there were sort of boundary issues there like mm. it, you know kind of got to the point where it would be like if she didn't want me to to go out or have a certain friends or do something like that a normal teenager would do. It wasn't even worth fighting her on it anymore. Mm. Like I would fight it. And then at a certain point, it's like, it's not even worth it. I'm just going to like get through this and graduate. And this won't be an issue anymore. But of course it remains an issue. (laughs) Yeah. How many things in your life did you do out of that sense that you couldn't hurt your mom Uh, or disappoint her? Well, you know, a big thing I wish that I had changed my last name. Ah. And this isn't really my mom thing, but my parents kind of thing. So yeah, <laughs> like my par- I always say like my parents, <laughs> they were narcissists. I mean, like I, they're both amazing in their own way. And my dad just passed away like relatively recently and, and it's been a, a, gr- a huge loss. But, you know, I always okay. say that like my, 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 my nickname in, in, in the family, well, my brother too, like we, we should have just been called narcissistic supply <laughs> because that's what we were there for to right. just like confirm their existence mm-hmm. and like validate them and show the way ways in which they were better than their own parents or where they had come Mm. from so uh what are the oh yeah so i my name is this like source of of great um great frustration because first of all so i say dom it's d-a-u-m but we grew up saying daum Mm. and we're constantly correcting people like most people would say dom and we would just correct it no daum 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 and like at a certain point, I I realized that my cousins and like everyone on my dad's side of the family was just were just always saying Dom, like uh-huh. like it wasn't even, and we didn't really know my cousins for various reasons, <laughs> and so they were saying Dom, and I was like, wait a second, like what is the actual pronunciation? And it turned out that my parents, after, when they were first married, had run into some German professor, and the German professor was like, no, it should be Dom, like if you're in Germany, Uh, but they wanted to show how much more sophisticated they were than their families, than my father's (laughs) family. So they started saying down. And so like at a certain point, I just stopped correcting people. And then later on, I just started saying Dom, which is bizarre because people who have known me my whole life are like, didn't it used to be down? Like, which is it? hilarious. So, but, but to answer your question, one of the things I did not do early on that I wish I had was change my name. Ah. I like in the very beginning of my career, I should have just like picked any sort of simpler name, different name, um, and just used it. And I would, I would never have done it because I think my parents would have been so devastated and insulted and offended, and it just would not have been worth fighting them. However, they were also so embarrassed by what I wrote that I would have saved them a lot of grief if I had changed my name. But uh. it would have been such a, there would have been that, this is like a, a classic no win situation because if I had changed my name, they would have been offended. Uh, if I, you know, if I had changed my name and and published things, they would have been slightly less embarrassed, but at the same time, they would feel shortchanged because right. I wasn't writing under their name. Like, there's just no winning. <laughs> Why? You were married, though, right? Oh, I was married later. You didn't take your husband. No, then. no. I mean, I didn't get married. Uh, I didn't get married till I was almost 40. Oh, I got okay. married when I was 39. Okay. Yeah, there was no way I was going to change yeah, my name at that no. point. Yeah, it's too much. <laughs> when yeah. did you start your, when when did your career start? Early. Okay. So, yeah, I. I yeah, you've been at this for a yeah, while. Yeah, huh? so I started publishing when I was in my early 20s. Mid- and always yeah. opinion? Um, essays. Mm. So I, um Yeah, I really, you know, I thought I was going to be a fiction writer. So when I started, you know, I'm really bad at everything else. Like, I literally have no skills. (laughs) Like, I cannot, I cannot cook. I cannot do math at all. Like, I cannot (laughs) speak any languages. So uh, I just always wrote and um, 
I thought it would be a fiction writer. I kind of, in the beginning, I thought like, I, I didn't, if you want to be a writer, I thought you were either like a novelist or a newspaper reporter or something. I didn't right. know there was any lane in between. Right. That. And I, and I was too chicken to be a newspaper reporter. So I was like writing kind of bad short stories in college. And then I got a job um, after college. I got a job in a magazine in New York. I was like an editorial assistant, like Devil Wears Prada situation, like yeah. abusive. Talk about like toxic femininity, oh, like working God. in an office, like the fashion magazine office. <laughs> My girlfriends who have jobs in this city, I have heard the most horrific stories of abuse from their female bosses. Yeah. I mean, it's you. I couldn't even write it if I tried. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it is a thing. Yeah. And, uh, so, and I don't think that's a patriot. But you know, that's like an example of grit. I have to say, I had a really, really kind of crazy boss. I mean, I guess she was abusive. But I, don't, I mean, but that was something where I, I figured out. Like she literally set her wastebasket on fire the first day I was working there because that you could smoke in the office. Like she threw a cigarette in a wastebasket with paper in it and it got on fire and she would be like, Megan, although she probably called me the wrong name, like, yeah. her, like her, the assistant that she had just fired, like, you know, Emily, but you know, Karen, get whatever. And um, it was really, really hard. And, you know, she would do things like transpose phone numbers when she wrote them down or like, you know, or dial the wrong number and yeah. then accuse me of like writing down the wrong number, like gaslighting yeah. in a huge way before anybody used that word. But I figured out eventually that the way to deal with her was to yell back at her. And I, I write about this in the book. And um, and she kind of just like stopped and was like, oh, she you're going to stand you. up to yeah. me. And she respected me. And after that, like everything changed. Like she still yelled at me and stuff, but I would yell back and it really just sort of lightened the whole tone and uh. she let me do things. And it was, it was to a total epiphany. Wow. Um, and I wouldn't recommend this as a job uh, strategy necessarily, but in that case, that was like a moment where I was like, Oh wow, actually like this is one way you can handle somebody in some instances it doesn't always work how old were you like 22 wow so it's so hard to learn how to stick up for yourself yeah. though in general but see that was an example where humor and irony and sarcasm like totally came into play yeah and like i could kind of just like call her out on it but like have a little smile and like i'm ribbing her and she was ribbing me and then like the yelling at me kind of turned into a joke and i could take it as a joke right and it really just like it turned the whole workplace dynamic into a sort of stage play in yeah. a way it felt like a comedy of errors like when instead of making a mistake and having it be the end of the world for me i just treated it as like a comedy of errors right and i think that again like that sort of coping mechanism i don't know if it exists anymore for people mm. it feels very much like our generation like i just kind of was able to frame things in a way that um kind of just lightened them yeah somehow. Um, but that, yeah, that was really just such a brilliant insight in your book and something that I just haven't really considered at all is the difference in what we valued as Gen X and what millennials seem to value yeah. or what their values are and below. Yeah. And it never occurred to me that we had the, those things of, of val valuing toughness, being latchkey kids. Yeah. Having um you know that kind of apathy and whatever Aliveness. well yeah everything was about being cool mm -hmm. um everything was about sort of showing that you were indifferent mm -hmm. uh yeah so i talk about in the in the book this this idea that we sort of fetishized that that toughness mm -hmm. and um I think now that they, you know, I hate to say that I hate saying like they millennials, Gen Xers, like all these categories, it just feels very, it's just like very broad, but I, I have yet to figure out a more precise way of articulating this. But yeah, I think you see with, with a lot of people who are maybe, you know, 10, 15, 20 years younger that they almost fetishize fairness. Mm. And I don't know if that's because they grew up, like their parents were hyper aware of being fair or like making sure they, their needs were met. Or it's weird though. Coming them comfortable. Wouldn't we be their parents or no. wouldn't it be? Uh, no, the baby boomers are the millennials parents. Okay. So I think it's like they, it's a discomfort. I think that they th those parents were more aware of taking away discomfort and our parents never even thought of that. 
<laughs> yeah, we were uncomfortable all the time. <laughs> so in one they, way or it another. was just always that's life. And right, I just rem- right. I just that's the thing I say over and over again is why what happened to life isn't fair. And, that was and, the thing I, I heard the refrain right. I heard the most. Well, and I try to think of it as like that's life in the big city. Yeah. You know? And uh I guess so yeah, for me, I really wanted in my 20s, I wanted to have an experience where I felt like I was tough. Mm. And I know that's coming from a huge place of privilege. Like, I'm not just saying this to check my privilege in some rote way. But, you know, yes, I was like this. I grew up in the suburbs. Like, I was right. pretty, I was in a really boring town. Um, I did not have a lot to sort of hang my hat on in terms of um, having survived anything or being particularly interesting. So there was that, yeah. But I, I certainly, like... I, I was never interested in framing my experiences, the, the sort of challenging experiences I ran up against as something that, as things that were traumatizing. Right. Like it was just. This generation is much more trauma informed. I will give them that. And I think that that is one of the blessings that comes out of it. it. Yes, it's a good, it's a good thing in a lot of ways. Yeah, there's just a lot of, there's so much more information about. Right, right. But it's, moving through that trauma or getting over it and or not wearing it as a badge of pride or yeah it's just and again like i think that gen xers are in this really weird spot because we we're not that old but the you know the the society has changed so dramatically just in the last 10 years i know that our sensibility (laughs) is really really out of date in a way that it's the (laughs) it's the digital divide (laughs) though i mean that 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 to me is the biggest differentiating thing even between my youngest sister and i she's seven years younger than me and i was 18 when I got my first email, and so she was <laughs> eleven. Gonna, I'll never forget my first email. Yeah. That's funny. I don't, <laughs> that's, that's like your first period, your first. Yeah, email. but kids these <laughs> days just grow up with it. Oh, it's yeah. like to think of yeah. the first email. It's like what? What does that? Oh even my god! Mean? I remember I had an AOL. Yeah, like, so did I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a there's a story I tell in the book. You know, I lived with roommates. Uh, I, we had an apartment uh, near Columbia University, and. Um, one of my roommates is actually now Flo, the progressive insurance. Oh, lady, holy it or not. crap. Does she have a mansion in the Palisades? <laughs> she's, very, she's great. We're oh, my still God. They no, must, she's very she down to earth. Loaded. Well, she's great. She we were just worked. talking about that, actually. Her ad was on, and I was like, how many mansions do you think no, she has? No, she doesn't. I shouldn't speak of, I shouldn't speak about her without her permission, but yeah. um, she's like, the most down to earth that's amazing. amazing person but yeah i just had to shamelessly name drop her anyway oh, this story does not involve her but i had you know at any given time we had three roommates in this apartment and we would when a when a roommate moved out we would advertise for one and we would do this by like stapling a like a flyer to a telephone <laughs> pole like you know room like available a, yeah the old know, school five hundred dollars and so people would come in and audition to be our roommate you know it was like we had pre- so re- much power world. like it was right around the time of real world yeah. like the first season of real world and so this guy came in so my roommate and i we were about exactly the same age probably we were both like 25 or something and uh she was in film school and i was in getting an mfa in writing at columbia and so this guy came in he was probably in his mid to late 30s we perceived him as being probably 60 of course and he was this kind of like nebbishy guy. Yeah. Uh, nothing like to write home about or to be fearful of or to have any feelings about really. And he said something like, oh, well, how about this? You know, if if I if I lived here, how about I buy the food if you girls do the cooking? Gosh. And we couldn't even look at each other because we were going to burst out laughing. Yeah. We just were like, Oh my God, did he really say that? Oh my God, oh my God. Okay, boomer. <laughs> and uh, he left and we just about doubled over in hysterics. Yeah. And what strikes me about that in retrospect is that that was a reaction that really was of its moment because our mothers, if they had been in that situation 20 years earlier or 30 years earlier, I think would have been really angry because our mothers were second wave feminists right. who were dealing with very, you know, with like Mad Men era office 
sexual dynamics and actual chauvinism. Right. You know, before people talked about sexism, they talked about chauvinism, male chauvinism. Mm. And so that kind of statement from a man had really real ramifications for them. And so that would have been their reaction in the 60s. Fast forward 20 years. I think that if a guy said that to some girls in there who were 25, they would like run to their laptops and blog on their Tumblr accounts about what an asshole this guy was and oh, the misogyny and oh my gosh. (laughs) Do you think you would have back? No. Well, it's hard to say If, if, if that discourse existed I don't think I would have. I would have been who I am and probably like resisted it. I I just, it was, I just think it is incredible gift that we happen to come of age in a time where feminine feminism was far enough along that we were reaping certain benefits of it. And this social media wave of it had not yet caught on. So Mm -hmm. we were just sort of able to enjoy the spoils of it and have a sense of humor about that guy. Like that guy was just nothing to be taken seriously. He was like, you know, a gnat to be swatted at. Yeah. And I think that, you know, for our mothers, that guy would have had a lot of power. Yeah. And for young women today, they would have handed him a power that he didn't have. Like this whole punching up thing. Interesting. Um, You know, the whole sort of hashtag kill all men and snapping photos of guys on the subway who are man spreading this kind of thing and then posting them on social media sites. Like that to me, that's punching up. Yeah. And they're assuming they can do it because these men have power over women and that's actually just not necessarily true so as you have pointed out you're handing men power that they don't necessarily have yeah that i feel like we're and again i I sometimes wonder you and i are so aligned on that even when i was reading your book i'm like this is always what i'm saying to people too like young women why would you give them power right and that they don't even it's a jujitsu move against yourself i love that i love that it is it is because they're in so many cases, it's almost like creating a a monster so you have a monster to defeat. You know, they're, right. they're creating this thing that doesn't yeah. even exist. Well, it's also like, I like to think of it, you know, when it comes to the trauma thing, we're manufacturing our own trauma mm. in some mm-hmm. circumstances. Mm-hmm. And again, like I keep asking myself, what are we getting out of it? Why, why does this persist? And... I don't, I keep coming back to this idea that people are sort of lonely and they want affiliation and having this sort of grievance and forming clubs around it is a way of feeling like you belong to something larger than yourself. But do you, if you interviewed people about this, have you? Yeah. Do they say that that's why or do they feel like they're saving the world? Is it a sense of... Well, it depends on who they are. I mean, if there are people who sort of think like we do. um, And I have talked to people of all ages, like people are in their 20s and their 30s, teenagers who say like, I do not... I, I, I don't relate to what's going on. Like, I feel really separate from the kind of mainstream narrative around this. And yeah, I have had, you know, there's a, a young woman I interview in the book who was a Barnard student who came in, you know, thinking she was, uh, you know, self, you know, self-respecting lefty and, you know, actually I was dated women and, you know, really identified as on the left and social justice And uh, she started noticing things on the campus. She was from a very, not even working class, but very poor background in Cleveland, like actual trauma, real Mm -hmm. trauma, Mm -hmm. urban poverty. Yeah. And uh, she was started pushing back on some of the grievance stuff and the, and the, um, a lot of the stuff around, around sexual assault and title nine. And they really, turned on her like her uh, own peers turned on her and I talk you can, you can read more about it in the book but you know when I talked to her she she would say you know this is a way of feeling like you're part of the group yeah like people you know she even says in the book like when the alcohol starts flowing you know someone's going to start talking about how they were sexually assaulted wow. like it's just the go-to thing wow and that's what she told me. I have not been in conversations like that. I'm not a 19 year old Barnard student, so I'll have to take her word for it. Yeah. But, um, so that's that's one perspective. But yeah, so to answer your question, other people have certainly said this is a real problem and your generation just like accepted too much. And right. we're the ones who are going to 
put our foot down and say enough is enough. I was saying this. I've said this so many times on my podcast and like I, even talking to Christina Huff Summers when she was on and I asked her, I'm like, maybe we're just old. You right. know, maybe it's maybe because the younger kids that are the younger women I've talked to, I, I'm like, well, you pick your battles and like if a guy slaps my ass at work and when I'm right. waitressing, like who cares? It's Slap literally him back. Slap thousands him back. of yeah, times right. <laughs> as this has happened to me if I fought every single one and they're like, well, just because you old bags did like put up with right. that doesn't mean it's that like, I walked 12 it's okay. miles in the snow to school without any shoes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's that version of right. it. Like I got my ass slapped 12,000 times <laughs> while I was waitressing. Right. <laughs> And, and I had no shoes. And I had no shoes on. And you guys have it so good. But then I do this is the this is the conflict is in my mind is that I'm glad to see that people can talk about it openly because when I was drugged and raped, nobody was having this conversation. No one I knew had ever admitted to being raped. So maybe it's an overcorrection and we'll swing back. Maybe we just hear from the loudest because we're on Twitter and we're in media and perhaps around young kids who are just the average 19 year old they're It's not coming up or they're able to have a more nuanced conversation about it. I, I don't really know where it's so crazy to be a kid. Yeah. These yeah. days, like the kids these days. Well, I mean, I, really feel for them yeah i mean to to come up to come of age in in a culture where there's just a conversational chokehold where you can't you know even it's 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 one thing to try to to try to have an opinion about these things but you can't even reach an opinion if you're not allowed to ask certain questions and have a conversation about it yeah the thing that worries me is that we notice it because we didn't have it the next generation down is pushed against it and pushed for a bit of this conversational chokehold. The generation following doesn't even right, notice it. Right. It's it'll just be like the it water, will just be, fish and that's the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we can't have those conversations, we're not actually gonna fix the problems that we're complaining about. You know, I you know, one of the things that I say in the book, and this is why it's it, it's a self interrogation, I think that there are things that we take for granted. Um, just in terms of our ability to say, like, negotiate an, an in-person sexual encounter, how to get out of it. Like, we did not grow up with ubiquitous online pornography. Right. We learned how to have social interactions in person. Right. We were not texting. You know, our our, our, our earliest romantic uh, interactions did not take place via text. Right. And so it may be that our wiring just has allowed us to, to kind of have a more nuanced approach to all kinds of things that we do. And so maybe it's unfair for somebody who's, you know, in college now or who's 30 years old now, who's, you know, finding themselves in a, in a sexual encounter with somebody they maybe just met on an app. Mm -hmm. And maybe that person has been exposed to a lot of pornography and has certain expectations mm -hmm. and certain ideas about, about what one does. And that might change the whole equation around consent and what it means. So, right. you know, in the, in the course of writing this book, I think I've, I've really come around and, you know, I probably, when I started this project, <laughs> I would have said, oh, you guys are just so stupid with affirmative consent. Like, that's dumb. Like, right. you know, you've t it's so unsexy. Like, get it together. And now I just kind of feel like, you know what? That is not my problem to solve. Like, you know, I'm almost 50 years old. It's really none of my business what a 20-year-old wants to decide is consent or what is the proper way to to have some kind of sexual transaction. Like, that's th they have their own conditions right. that are informing that. Right. So I kind of think that maybe we need to be a little more laissez-faire. I'm more concerned with th the fact that we can't even get far enough to have that conversation. Like they should, mm. they should be left to their own devices, but they should also be allowed to talk it through uh, without being shut down. I tend to have the kind that feeling about it, despite my own opinions about affirmative consent. And I, again, like you try and approach it from all angles, including just that I don't have the same context that they do. All of that's fine and good until suddenly you start looking at what's happening in colleges and the Title IX. And then right. when there are legal ramifications for this stuff and apps and people are signing contracts on apps and 
it, people are signing consent contracts. Yeah, that. they have. Oh, apps. actually, tell me about that because I actually a friend of mine. We were kidding around about that like a year ago. Like, oh my god, that's an amazing idea. We should invent oh, it. Oh no, and there's there, probably it, like twelve of them already. Oh yeah. So what are so they? Many. They just they're affirmative consent, and you either go through with the partner before and say these are things that are on the table or off the table like or sex maybe acts? yeah. <laughs> On and the like, app? yeah, oh my god! And then you, so you get the kind of sexual profile of the other person before you engage, and you have, and then there are some. They're all different. There are some that you have them, um, like in the middle of the act, or you can be. But what I don't understand is that it, it, it's all retroactive. Can't you take back consent and say that I didn't consent to that? Yeah. That's so what's that's, the point? This is getting into like AI territory. Like, this, yeah. is, this is why people are going to start turning to, to sex dolls and yeah. like robots, as you've written about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, wow. and I think it's part of the reason why, for the first time since the sexual revolution, you're seeing, I, I think it's probably a, a large number of different factors, but one of them being it's just so confusing and they haven't been given the space to navigate that confusion. Right. Part of being, you can't erase awkwardness from sexuality. You cannot. There's just no way. You right. Can, you, or discomfort. Or un, yeah, especially in your teen years, especially or whenever you're first experiencing those sexual encounters, you can't navigate your way around that. You have to go through it. Right. And if you are trying to avoid that by having apps and consent and pro the problem is is that so much of this is all about explicit consent but there's so much of consent that is implicit it's implied right that's what you learn to navigate is the body language and and so how and that's what is missing in the flattened discourse right. how are you supposed to have any sort of uh eye and ear for body language uh, if you've been conducting most of your life on screens, mm. I mean, it's it's a totally different like skill set. It's an entirely it's like a it's a completely different it, it, register. Yeah, I was telling this nineteen year old that I'm friends with about um about how because she was trying to get in touch with her friends and they were all texting and I and I said you know how often do you guys actually talk and she said well we Facetime every once in a while but <laughs> I was thinking about how. Again, I had to go through the awkward experience of getting through the gatekeeper parents every time oh, I exactly. even wanted to talk to one of my friends. And the awkward, like, how are you doing, Mr. Brown? Uh, you know, like, oh, I'm good. How are you? How's school? All of those, right, like, right. they don't have to do any of that. I know. And, like, if a boy called you to ask you out, he yeah. would have to, like, your parents, your father might answer, and mm -hmm. he would have to say, so. oh, yeah. Or if you were on the phone and your right. mom was listening. I oh, mean, my that's gosh. Never, I know. They will never know that. Right. Although I think their parents, like, have GPS trackers. Their parents know where they are. Yeah, all it's the a time. different yeah. level. So, right. Um, yeah, I do think that there's something about just talking that has been that is missing. It's like, you know, I often think about how, you know, so much of so much of life has to do with figuring out what you actually think. Mm -hmm. And you can't figure out what you actually think unless you're really sitting there and trying to, to, to sort it through. So like the question, like, can we can we socially engineer the ick factor out of sex? No, no. But and would you want to? Apparently so, but no, but I don't, again, it's like, I don't even think there's, I don't think there's any, any sort of precedent for knowing what it means to kind of like sort through the stuff you don't like in order to get to the thing you, you do like, like, we're just so used to like having our settings and right. this is what it is. Right. And I, that's what these, where these apps come in, in terms of trying to navigate what you do and don't like, but then you're trying, it's just, it so... So much awkwardness. When I think of the spectrum of sexuality that I've gone through in my lifetime, I would say that 80% of it was awkward and 20% has been, <laughs> I feel like, okay, I've got. I wonder if that's a probably pretty good uh, ratio. It's just, I just think of how all the awkwardness and the, the 
Yeah. How do you even touch that first boob? You know, it's but like we it, forget. Oh, you know, and it's like this. I'm just thinking of this now. I'm like thinking out loud here. Like, is there what is awkwardness when you're texting? Like, mm. is what is what's the version of it? Because you have like the emojis, I guess, to kind of let somebody know that you're kidding. I, I, I never use emojis. Maybe I should. But yeah, there's no it's it's like we've just taken that lane out of the mm -hmm. out of the freeway. Like, yeah, there's really just these boredom these too. Two. This was another one in that book. Um, Adam Alter's book Irresistible. He talks about how we're basically erasing boredom, mm -hmm. so that we're nobody is incapable of just sitting and being with their thoughts. Right. We have to constantly lo be looking on our phone or entertaining ourselves. Or if we're in line, we used to just have to stand in line, maybe talk to the person behind right, us. Right. And now we have, uh, or be, be bored right. and impatient. And now it's like, we always have this device that can take away any right. dis uncomfortable feeling. But it's not actually a communication device. That's the thing. Right. So, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot so much of my writing career early on was about taking, looking at the world and trying to figure out where the hypocrisies are. Like mm. what's going on in the culture? People are, you know, thinking that they need to get on board with this, but actually what they actually, what they actually think is something else. And like, how do we, you know, what is this all about? And I would write really controversial pieces. Mm. I mean, I would write provocative pieces, nothing that was gratuitously so I don't think, but um, stuff that got angry letters to the editor and they were published in places like the New York Times right. and the New Yorker. Right. And, 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 you know, if I made people angry, that was like the job. Like that was, right. the, I was the idea and I was not going to get, there was no social media. There was no internet. Like this was the nineties, the you know, yeah. the, the mid to mid to late nineties. And so much of the, the thought process of being a writer was was trying stuff out like to be an essayist to just kind of like throw a bunch of ideas out there and try to make sense of them mm -hmm. and and a, so much of it was informed by conversations i had with people mm. you know i would i would sort through ideas by talking to my friends so you think about it like in the 90 you know before the internet what would one's life be like you would come home if you were you know unless you, you would come home from work if you happen to live alone what would you do? You would either go out with your friends for drinks or whatever and like talk to them, talk, talk, talk and like sort through ideas or you would pick up the phone and you would call your friend, mm -hmm, right? And you mm -hmm. would talk to them for an hour, at least I would. And there was there was no distraction. The right. phone was attached to the wall. Right. You couldn't you walk can around move. your, I mean, maybe you had a cordless phone if you were fancy, but you, you couldn't, you were not driving. You were not walking down the street. You were not shopping. You were not doing other stuff. And people really had sustained conversations. And, and through that, you sort of know when, that somebody says something and it might not be entirely what they mean. Like they could say something that was could possibly sound a little offensive, but you know they don't mean it because the conversation continues. And so that entire way of communicating has just been erased yeah essentially and it's well all... other than podcasts exactly which i and think I, is why yes. they've been so huge 100 percent. yes it's it's the closest we can come to that mm -hmm. and it's ironic because like i find myself i'm walking around you know this on with my earbuds in listening to your podcast yeah or listening to you know people talking for three hours and yeah. i'm walking down the street and it's like well how come i'm not just with my friends talking for three hours yeah yeah, I, and I don't, there's just no time, or it's just the 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 metabolism of society doesn't allow for it anymore. Yeah, that's interesting. And then the people in the podcast start feeling like your friends. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I talk about that in the book. I yeah, mean, my whole sort of journey into the intellectual dark web. It, it yeah. came. It came out of feeling lonely. Yeah, and it came. Um, really out of my divorce. I mean, I got I, I, a huge part of this book, not a huge part, but I, I talk in the book about how I got I got divorced around or I split up with my husband around 2015. And it was right around the time when these culture wars started to heat up. And, you know, my husband for all of our problems had really been my intellectual ally. Yeah, like we just talked all the time. We were on the same page about things. And it was a great solace to to not feel alone in that sense. And so we split up and suddenly I was noticing that a lot of my friends were sort of, you know, going hashtag kill all men on yeah. Twitter. And I'm thinking like, whoa, what happened here? And I started to feel really lonely. Yeah, I know that. I felt so isolated around that same time. Yeah. 
just so isolated. Yeah. If there was no internet and no Twitter and no like Dave Rubin, I would have been lost. It was pretty remarkable. Mm. I mean, I remember, I, I remember like watching, I would watch bloggingheads.tv. Yeah. I would watch Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter. They were my gateway into all of this. And, um, you know, I just remember like there was a snowstorm and being like stuck in, in this apartment that I was renting. I had left Los Angeles when we split up and moved back to New York. And I just like watched like hours and hours and hours of blogging heads because I was so lonely and like, you know, cold. And, and it was like this weird, it was Time. so strange, like so, so pathetic on one level, but also like so moving and poignant on another. Do people accuse you of being red pilled all the time? I, no one is probably like behind my back mm. but you know i say in the book it, it's it was not a red pill thing it was like a combination of a whole bunch of pills mm -hmm. <laughs> um and it's 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 not that simple because there are a lot of, a lot of that stuff um i really can't stand like a lot of the cognitive dissonance was like oh i i don't you know i, I i'm not into the hashtag kill all men people i want to get away from them but a lot of the people who are who are sort of resisting that are kind of doing it in a way that is also ham fisted and not that nuanced. So yeah, no, totally. I, I was, I was joking on stage about how when you're in this space, you'll say something about free speech, for instance, you'll be like, we need to, you know, fight for free, free speech. And then if you get retweeted by some, the wrong person on the right, for instance, suddenly in your mentions it's like yeah and fuck black people and you're like no 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 right, i know no 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 Some kind of help is the kind that's, of help that's could not all do where we're that. going either right well also like these the, these terms are tripwires now free speech right. is dog whistle for right it's like, crazy all right in some people's minds and there are racists so to act like people yeah. aren't right i mean i've seen and there are misogynists i've been <laughs> i've been take gone after whenever i get you know dog piled by the right i'm like oh my god you yeah. guys need a clean house too but you know the thing is do you get as upset about that as when you get piled on by the left i'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor new year new you guys and by new you i mean get your s together and start grooming down below the belt <laughs> it's 2020 we don't have any excuses for jungles down there and smelly, sweaty balls. Not when you could have Manscaped products delivered to your door. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your man's family jewels. Their Lawnmower 2.0 has proprietary skin safe technology, so this trimmer won't nick or snag your man's nuts. Men, listen up. Untrimmed pubes are a thing of the past. Cleanliness wins the way to my heart. The modern man manscapes in a hygienic way. Don't use the same trimmer on your face as you're using on your balls. That's disgusting. And let's talk about the stinky balls. Can we please? We all know how sweaty balls smell. And if you don't know how sweaty balls smell, I hope you never have to. That's why Manscaped also has the Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. Men, you already put deodorant on your armpits hopefully, and if you don't, please start doing that. Why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest parts of your body? And these products smell good. Their manly scent is attractive and will help set the mood, unlike that stanky smell, which immediately kind of does takes away from the mood. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. Ladies, this is the perfect gift for you and your man. And trust me, he will thank you. And men, your balls will thank you. And more importantly, your lady will thank you. So guys, get 20% off and free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code WALKIN. Here's the difference that I've perceived between the left and the right, and it's the most frustrating to me. At least the right is honest. So they're openly usually racist or misogynistic. They're not even trying to hide it. And on the left, I feel like it's a weird authoritarian vibe that's hidden as in as like, oh, we're worried about the greater good, which is way more terrifying to me than I can fight the stuff on the right. 
it's upsetting to me for sure when the when like the men's rights activists came after me and um the incels legitimately i was terrified i have never been called more horrifying things and had pictures of me that were horrific and um what were they reacting to what did the incels get upset about they were just mad at me because I I kicked the hornet's nest to be fair, but they were they were, there are certain you know whenever I whenever I push back against um, banning porn, whenever I st- stand up for sexuality, basically that's when they'll come after me and call me a herpes ridden slut that is ruining mankind. Yeah, I would think that so the incels don't like porn, or they just don't like. Yeah, they're they're just you're the kind of woman that they can't get. No, so they, they don't want you. To, it's just yeah, right. It's, it's not the, coherent. It's not coherent, but it's not. It's more just. Um, rage you know it's like really blind terrifying it's words that they make up things entire diatribes i wrote a piece about for mel magazine it was all about a woman scorn and i was just saying women can be scornful and crafty and and the way that they interpreted what i wrote they wrote this whole essay about it i it was right I, and like i've said before this Sometimes they're not wrong. They'll be like, "Oh, with her stepdad issues," and I, I there's a lot of stuff that they say where you're like, Ugh. "Right," but it's very hurtful. It's hurtful in a completely different way than it is from the left, where, and particularly when I'll be getting write a piece that is nuanced, so I'll be getting it from both sides, and that's when I get hurt because I'm like, "You guys are supposed to be defending me from this," because they don't see that the yeah. people. On, the the left wing radicals don't see the that I'm getting attacked by incels well, and, and they also the, don't see how much they sound alike. Well, exactly, it's the horseshoe theory, right? Yeah. So they they touch each other. It's on a the, circle, on the extreme. Though. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. I do think that when you're getting attacked by both sides, that's when you know you've succeeded. I feel the hurt I feel from the left is more rejection. It feels more like abandonment and rejection. Well, that's because you also hold the left into higher account, probably. And from the right, it feels really just like pure rage. And um, right. uh, It feels it definitely feels more like my I feel more physically afraid is that because you're the people you're imagining, not that you're imagining it, but the, the people on the right like have guns or they're just like stupid? No, because they like, literally uh, threaten to kill me right, all the time. Right, I don't right, get right. as many death threats from the left right. as I do the right. 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 And the people who do call me garbage and tell me that they want, they don't tell, this is again the fucked up thing about the left. The left won't tell you they want to kill you. They'll tell you to go kill yourself. Oh, interesting. They'll say you're garbage. Go kill yourself. So they won't say, I want to kill you. They'll just psychologically try and get in your head and make you want to freaking kill yourself. And it's usually women who are who are launching those things at me online from the left. That is so fascinating. So they're passive aggressive. The left is passive aggressive and the right is aggressive. And again, it goes back to the thing of being just more the right is more a uh, uh, more honest. Like, But is it just because do you think they're stupider? I mean, you know, no. in, the, in, in the basis terms. No, you know? I think it's more it's a, a more because the the left has always thought that they're pure ones on the right side of history. Well, they have the moral they're authority. The, they're the good ones. Right. That's what they see. And it used to be the conservatives that thought that about themselves, like the old school conservatives, like, yeah. like the social conservatives or family values and, and st- you know, just button down. Yeah, be a, be a you know solid wasp kind of thing. You know, until all of their skeletons started coming out of the closet, and then I feel like maybe that's why they had to become just more honest about their mm-hmm. vices. And my friend Ben Howe makes this point a lot. He talks about how on the right you see a lot more vice signaling, which is really interesting. So on the on the left you'll see a lot of virtue signaling, and on the right it's almost like they're proud of their vices of being kind of bullies or being whatever oh, it is not and, vices and like they're proud to be substance abuse no or anything like no that. okay more okay. just like so they're bulliness so or, they're right yeah they're bad they don't they just they're being asked they're proud to be assholes yeah yeah right interesting and i don't i think that probably has been 
Trumpism has not helped that. No. Oh, no. <laughs> it's rewarded that. Yeah. It's enshrined it. Yes. Yes. Huh. It's, yeah. I mean, the thing about it is there there used to be, what, what just kills me is that there's no... Um, there's no reward for actually thinking something through. Like you're so incentivized to just say the most reductive oh, yeah. thing. Jonah Goldberg said this to me ages ago when I first got into the culture wars and he was like, let me tell you something. There's no money in nuance, kid. <laughs> no, <laughs> and no. It's, I'll never forget it. It's just like. But, I, but see, this is the thing. And I feel like I'm, I really, I, I feel I, I this I I almost get like tears in my eyes. Like I have my student, you know, I teach graduate students, and they'll come to me and they'll say like I have something I really want to say, and I I really want to write this piece. I want to write this essay, whatever. And not only are they afraid of publishing it, they're afraid of bringing it into the class because right. they're afraid that their classmates are gonna turn on can't them. cancel them. And it really it 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 gets me choked up because. I was a student in this very program myself when I was in my early 20s, this time we're talking about when I was writing these essays, I was trying out ideas and I was rewarded for taking those risks. Yeah. I was in the New York Times. Like that was the job and that was what you had to do to to get those assignments. You were rewarded by getting another assignment. Yep. You know, you did take the hits. Like, you know, I did have people writing angry letters to the editor. And, and you had an editorial staff that would defend you. Well, and and I had editors that saved me from myself, right. that, that made me write the best possible piece, that held me accountable, um, that made sure I was totally clear. But there was so much more time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, I just, it is such a loss and it, I, I don't know how we're gonna get out of this. I mean, if, if what I really feel most, um, most worried about is not sort of like, oh, consent, like, you know, oh, what are we gonna do? Uh, you know, no, nobody's gonna be able to have sex anymore. You know, me too. Yeah, all I'm this not stuff. Like, about I mean, I, it's it's annoying, and it's certainly like gone too far. It's not that productive all the time. But for me, the bigger problem is that. There's just, um, we have absolutely lost any, not just incentive, but any ability to sustain a complex argument to, mm. to, you know, other than these podcasts, which frankly, I'm afraid it's only a matter of time before somebody gets canceled for like, you know, somebody dips into at the 49 minute mark, somebody said something yeah. that they shouldn't have and it's all over. I'm yeah. surprised it hasn't happened already. I mean, it probably does. It has happened a few times, but it's not. Hey, in case you're, <laughs> here's an idea. And since if you're listening to this, the whole point to me of being a being a writer, being a public thinker, is to say the things that people are thinking but either can't articulate or are afraid to say right. out loud. Like that's why I got into this, mm. and that's really what excites me about it, and what gives my frankly life meaning. I, yeah. I'm not kidding. I don't mean to be be like. It's grandiose. It it really I find it very moving to like, you know, be the one to to say the things that other people maybe don't even realize that they yeah. want, have to say, but they're thinking and or don't so, have the time to articulate because the time. they're trying to make ends meet right, and right. Don't I mean, have I'm the really time lucky. Like it. I don't have you know, the thing is like I am really spoiled. Like I don't have kids. I, I live alone. Like I have a lot of I have an incredible amount of freedom. Mm -hmm. And um I, I just feel like it it would be it would be a, a dereliction of duty not to be speaking up about these things, especially now. Like a lot of people told me not to write this book. By the way, oh, I bet. How has it been received? <laughs> <laughs> it's been received pretty much exactly as I anticipated, mm -hmm. which is that um, people on the ground love it. Mm -hmm. I do book signings. People are like waiting in line, like uh. thanking me, like you know, in tears in some cases, like, oh my gosh, I feel less alone. Uh-huh. Um, but then the, you know, a lot of the the reviews have been pretty harsh. Mm. Um, but again, like the reviews, I feel like they're just I, I could I could I feel like taking them and putting them in the paperback edition of the book because it's exactly what the book is talking about. Right. It's not I mean there have been some really thoughtful pieces, but in some cases, there's just like a, a complete unwillingness to engage the book on its own terms. Right. You know, and they just like, attack you. Well, personally. it is. I mean, it's not or they attack me personally, but then they say like, well, she's just being lazy because she wants it both ways or, you know, she's right. saying that. Well, it's like, yeah, actually it is. I that Yes. 
Yeah. It is all these things. Yeah. And it's complicated and it's a self interrogation and it's not just like one side or another. And I'm sorry that you can't distill that into a headline. And therefore what's the point of writing the piece at all. Yep. But that's just kind of, kind of how it is. Um, and I knew that, um, I, I would never forgive myself if I didn't write this book. Mm. So I kind of feel like, you know, w- when you write books, you should approach every every book project of, as if you might never write another book. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's been certainly there are moments that have felt destabilizing. It but, sounds like this has taken quite a lot of resilience. This book? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to like oversell that. I mean, obviously like, there's <laughs> harder things in life. No, no, bad I know. Um, no, but just even the yeah. fortitude to continue because fr- as it sounds like in the book, you were going in one direction with it and then the election happened. Oh, yeah. And then you had to take a different tack and now... Yeah, yeah. I, so, right. It, this It's a pretty short book. It's like just over 200 pages, but it took me three years to write because I probably wrote 800 pages worth mm-hmm. of material. Yeah, initially it was just going to be about feminism. It was going to be about this kind of fourth wave, you know, talking about toxic masculinity all the time, sort of social media feminism and the ways in which I was not relating to it. The book was going to be called You Are Not a Badass. Mm. And it was just going to be this sort of manifesto. And I thought everybody would be able to take it because we were going to have a female president. So, you know, Mm. get over yourselves. Mm. And... Uh, obviously things did not go that way. That's fascinating. So it's fascinating how the culture shift can completely affect what the culture can hear. Yeah. I mean, that was something that on the Shonda Rhimes masterclass, actually, she was talking. I love you took that. Oh, you do. Oh, I love it. Oh my gosh. Um, I didn't go to college. So this is, I like these things because they're, they're entered. They are short and, it's not like I'm going to learn how to do anything in depth, but I do get these little nuggets that are so insightful. And Shonda was talking about how she couldn't have done scandal. Like West Wing was um, aspirational. And so, and during the Bush years, the culture needed something like that. And scandal was so popular because we were in this Pollyanna ish Obama years. Right, right. And so she was saying, always look for something that's kind of counter to whatever, whatever direction the culture is going in because that's generally what they can handle. Right. So it's interesting that your book is a perfect example of that. It essentially, you had to go in a different direction because they couldn't handle you really coming out and saying this feminism is a little bit right well and also it grew so much bigger than uh, than about feminism Mm -hmm. i mean uh it's very quickly it was about this sort of larger problem of not being able to speak yeah and you know one of the worst things to come out of trump i think i mean that's the list is long (laughs) yeah goes without saying is that you know there's this idea on the left that the trump emergency is so acute that we cannot afford any kind of complicated discussion right you know we need all hands on deck we need everybody just hashtag resistance right and the most simple obvious uh unweaponizable by the other side kind of discourse and it's really it's it's an excuse for intellectual laziness. I mean, I understand the logic of it in some ways, but I think it's going to backfire. Well, I was saying this the other day on the I mean, I think it did backfire in the UK. You're, you're seeing that. And just the other day, Gary Kasparov or Kasparov, or however you say his last Kasparov, Kasparov yeah. he was going on some thread rant about Trump and Trumpism and essentially saying we need to because certain people Huckabee joked about him staying over his term and and Trump trolls the left on staying three terms because he's made these jokes or references we need to get him out you know no matter what and I'm like you can't you're arguing that we basically undermine democracy in order to preserve democracy so it's already dead then in that case why and you're also arguing that this there's no evidence that this person is going to do this if he wins and refuses to leave okay we will cross that bridge right. but until then it's a thought crime you know you you're you're going to try and yeah attack people for things that they might do based on things that you're inferring from either jokes or tweets or things right. that 
it's just no it's, worrisome. Yeah, no, the whole thing. I just feel like our entire structure has collapsed. Mm. Our entire structure of logic, our entire notion of strategy. Mm. I mean, that's the other thing is the left does not have any sense of strategy. It's almost like that's another tripwire word. You know, Mark Lilla came out with, um, you know, right after the election, he wrote that you know, op-ed in the New York Times that went viral that was basically taking all this stuff on. It said, you know, you run Hillary Clinton, you run a, a, a campaign based on identity politics. This is what's going to happen. You're right. appealing to, to Twitter, but that's not everybody. Mm -hmm. Guess what? And so, you know, he, he, he talked about this and he just got castigated as, as a right winger. And this is like a liberal Columbia professor. Wow. And so, you know, I guess it's like you, you can't even, I, I, I get worried even talking about how, how counterproductive identity politics in the political arena is because it's like, it seems so obvious. Oh, but this is what I was going to say about, about Mark Lilla. He talked about how identity politics is about strategy for the left. Mm -hmm. So a word like strategy, also a word like nuance falls into this category, has been turned into a tripwire. Wow. Like if you say strategy, then you must be saying that you don't care about marginalized people. Like they'll yep. say like, fuck your strategy. We don't want to wait anymore. Like trans rights can't wait. People are dying. You know, there are babies in cages. Fuck your strategy. Right, like, right. well, no, that's not, that is not like there's, that is incoherent actually. Mm -hmm. And in, in fact, if we don't have a good strategy, this is going to get worse. Like the, you're not going to get any of the rights you want. Like let's get somebody in office and then start worrying about that stuff. Yeah. It's so, it, it's crazy. I, I have da good days and bad days and it's based, you know, that cognitive dissonance that you describe. I feel like I, I swing between feeling optimistic and like this is, I wrote a piece kind of, right when the inauguration came out about Trump is already making America great again. And in certain ways, I think it's like drawing this kind of poison out to the surface that's been under, you can't, I've always, I said you can't lance a boil until it comes to the surface. And so there's so much stuff that is now out in the light that was not out in the light and right. that we can address. And, but the problem is we can't have, if we can't have conversations with each other about anything that and people are petrified to say anything yeah. it's it won't go it will just recede back into the darkness or right. it will be repressed and so my fear on my good days and i feel like okay we're having these conversations this is good the younger jet i love gen z they really seem to like get their uh, i agree they seem like they they're they're, they're fed up with this yeah they're reacting to it as well yeah. because they grew grew up with it and they're pushing back so then on and then on my bad days, I'm like, we're fucked. I, the structure, the checks and balances aren't holding. As um, my friend Pamela Presky, she writes a lot about the psychology. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. she's brilliant, and she's. I hope she finishes her book soon. But she writes a lot about the psychology for democracy, and it's just such a fascinating idea that we've lost this psychology that's necessary to maintain a democracy. Right. And what does that look like? What do we, what values do we need to be encouraging in order to maintain that? And what is it? Is it like critical thinking? Critical it, thinking, due process. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think logic. We right. don't have logic anymore. Just not taking every, I mean, the, it's so funny. I have a friend and he is meticulous in his thinking and everyone should approach every single thing that they see on the internet the way that he does and it's like he'll see a headline he'll read the article he'll read the study he'll see who sponsored the study you know he does such a deep dive into where is this actually coming from what's the source material who is even responsible for the source material and if everyone had that kind of process where they didn't just read the headline and react right, to it right. or read. But like you said, we're incentivized. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if you remember maybe about six weeks ago or so, there was a piece in the New York times and the opinion page by a mother who was talking about how she was worried that her teenage son was being sucked. Into oh yeah. Adult, right. And yeah. the headline was something like, watch out for your white sons. They're being, they're being you know, radicalized like by Jordan Peterson and this. And, and, you know, she started talking about how, 
uh, like her son had been joking about the word triggered, like using it ironically. And so she thought that was a red flag. My nephew's been using triggered ironically for like right. five years. Well, I mean, these are asking to be used. Yeah. Right. I mean, everything. What did you think was going to happen? Right. right. So there was that. And then she's talking about like the, the YouTube algorithm. It's going from Jordan Peterson to Stephen Molyneux. Who knows? I don't even know who she, but there, there was a really hysterical tone to this piece. It was reminding me of the way people used to talk about satanic preschool uh, mm. activities like in the book I talk a lot about in the late 80s and the early 90s there was this whole movement around um, parents being afraid that th- there I mean there were actual there were cases people went to prison over this because there was this idea that preschool workers were Satan worshipers and they were abusing children in this just like grotesque completely unbelievable way uh, and this was around the time of recovered memory syndrome mm. and like there was a lot of this anyway so I said something in this tweet like wow this New York Times piece about her son being uh, radicalized on YouTube is reminds me of like satanic preschool panic. Uh, and it's just paranoid, social panic. And so I got all these likes and retweets and everything. And I felt very proud of myself. And a couple people messaged me like three separate people that I know personally. And they said, you know, I saw your tweet. And I got to tell you, you're wrong. I have a teenage son. I'm a parent. I'm a mom. And this is a thing that I notice, and I really worry about it. And I, he's on YouTube all the time, and this is nothing to take lightly. Like, that was glib. I just want you to know. And I thought, hmm. And we kind of, like, talked about it a little more, not on the phone or in person, I'm sorry to say, but in DMs. And it became evident that what was really happening with their sons was that they were being fed all this intersectional doctrine in school. Like right. they were being, you know, there's some 14 year old kid yeah. is being told that he's the oppressor yep. and, and they're reacting to it and that he needs to sit down and shut up and listen, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, whether or not that's, you know, verbatim what he's told, it's what he's hearing. Right. And so that was what was making him, vulnerable right. slash interested in the Jordan Petersons of the world and and the YouTube algorithm. So so the real story was about how misapplied intersectionality was enabling the alt right on YouTube. Which, okay. Yeah. That should have been the piece in the New York Times. All yeah. right. But that is just too complicated. Yeah. Like it took a long time for me to say just now. Yeah. And, and you know, it certainly doesn't fit on a headline. And so it, that's like the kind of conversation that we're not allowed to have anymore. Like we can't, we don't have the bandwidth to have it. Right. We don't have like the character limit to have it. So that actually worries me more than anything mm. um, because the, the hysteria is incentivized. And where's the path? What I always ask the people, where's the path to the left? Because if you are in, if you, if you're cannibalizing all of the, the bridge between the radical left and the center or center right, where exactly is that pathway? How does that pathway even exist? You mean, how do you get to? It, you're saying if you're on YouTube and you're and there's they're like, oh, it only goes in one direction. Well, that's because you broke the bridge right. to the other direction. Yeah. There is no other direction. Right. What direction are they? What when that water starts to roll, when they find someone who's maybe Dave Rubin, where do they go to the left? Yeah, well, the problem is, too, like the gatekeeping is now being left to the people like the gatekeeping is being crowdsourced. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I recently wrote a piece about this new Jordan Peterson film. It's Mm -hmm. a documentary about him. It's called The Rise of Jordan. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's It's been getting like banned. Okay, so it was made by these two Canadian filmmakers, people on young people on the left from, you know, art backgrounds. You know, they were actually they were already embedded with Peterson because the director she was making a film about his involvement with this native tribe like you know Uh. it was a very pc documentary actually about peterson and he was doing some like uh, i i'm not gonna whatever i'm not gonna describe this correctly but it was like a real like art film Uh and it had nothing to do with politics whatsoever and in the middle of making the film the 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 gender pronoun scandal Uh. erupted and they kind of just kept the cameras rolling And so they followed him around for the next three years. And it is an incredibly, the the, the piece is, the the film is not about Peterson, really. It's about what happened around him. It's about the misinterpretation of him and everything else in the culture. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a Peterson propaganda film. It's a film about propaganda. Mm -hmm. And it's so well done. And I think it, it, it captures as well as anything I've seen, uh, the real problem of, of discourse Mm -hmm. in, in this, in this moment. So, 
film uh, is it's getting banned like yeah. theaters won't screen it and and in some in most cases like the reason they wouldn't show it it's not because the public complained it's because people working in the theaters complained yeah. like the the staff young staff members said they did not feel safe yeah showing this film and so I wrote a piece saying, you know, really what this is about is the death of of cultural gatekeepers. Mm. Like it used to be the job of somebody who was film programmer at an art house to just say, hey, guys, no, this is a good movie and we're going to show it. Right. And if you are working at a theater, you care enough, you know, to apply for a job here and work here. Maybe you could learn something. Right. But but no, right. you know, it's the same thing. Like like David Remnick wanted to interview Steve Bannon, the New Yorker Festival, mm. and people complained because they think giving a platform to some, somebody like that is tantamount to endorsing him. And Remnick, for all kinds of reasons, decided not to interview him. Wow. And I mean, I think it probably just the nature of the New Yorker Festival and, you know, what that's about in terms of revenue and all sorts of things. He probably he didn't have a choice. And, right. But you know, we see this again and again. Errol Morris made a documentary about Steve Bannon and it was a Errol Morris joint, you know? It was just the kind of film he always makes where these the camera's on the person and he's the person's gonna talk and they're gonna hang themselves. He's always made these right. he did one about Robert McNamara, we did one about Donald Rumsfeld. At this time, no. You know, nobody would show it. Everybody wow. complained. They call it they're they're trying to cancel Errol Morris. Weren't you talking about the mattress girl? Yeah, I talk about her in the in the book. Yeah. yeah, didn't she? What weren't there pieces recently that she got red pilled or something? Or was I hallucinating? Uh, no, there was a piece in New York Magazine. Yeah, so Emma Silkowitz, just does your audience know she is automatically? She's carried her mattress around Columbia University where she was a student for well for at least a year um, in protest. What the, year was that? It was. Um, 2014 15 okay, yeah. right around this time yeah. right so yeah so so she had a you know accused a classmate of sexual assault and the case was adjudicated and finally this the school did not expel him although his life is ruined um yeah. and she protested this the school's decision by carrying her dorm room mattress around with her everywhere and it was also part of her thesis and she became the symbol international symbol of this movement so now actually college students they'll carry their pillows sometimes uh, as a as an echo of this like she really that was you know she's the symbol of the movement right so yes yeah, so now um yeah there have been some articles she's been spotted at like hanging out with libertarians and stuff, oh so. boy she got pushed i don't know that's hilarious so it's funny i went to a christmas party and it was all people kind of in the space and Again, I just don't think we realize how much we self-censor. And <laughs> I started it, writing. What a Christmas party that must have no, been. No, it was so, really fun because at this great. Christmas party, I didn't have to. Oh, my God. So I wish just, I had gone. Where it was, was it? It was so nice and just it was such a relief. I started writing a piece last year about self-censoring and asked for a call. And then the gate, the left wing came after me. These All these reporters. And they were saying you can't write this piece. This is going to be another thing. It's just another, this is, I, I mean, it was crazy how much reaction I got to my call for people to tell me how they had been self-censoring. <laughs> what do they care? What kind of piece? Because you write? mind you, most of it was people from the left telling me how they had been self-censoring. They thought it was going to be people from the right talking about how they were oppressed oh. by whatever. But it was mostly people from the left, right. which is what I was looking for. Right. And I will tell you, I was so I got 600 emails. I was so upset by so many. I would go and I was sitting in this corner where there was a bed. I like had to rearrange this room because it was so, I, my cousin would come in and she's like, okay, you are in a dark place. Like you're only allowed to read these emails for an hour a day because it was so upsetting to hear how people are starting to, you know, we all self-censor to a certain amount at work. Yeah, and yeah. But it's something different. Right. And that's wh exactly why this whole argument like, oh, this is just happening on Twitter. You're making a big deal. No, you're making a big deal about a bunch of campus radicals. No, this is actually no. infiltrating ev at We're every We're not level. hearing about the micro cancelings, right. the little ones, yeah. the mommies who are being shamed out of mommy groups right. by the couple of radicals well, in the well, group. People are that, losing their jobs. Yeah. I mean, people are, are it's, it's, it has financial consequences. It, this is not, you know, and, and it affects people at all levels. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another thing that's been interesting about this is they'll say like, oh, well, it's easy for you to write this book. You know, you're, you're a privileged white feminist. This is, 
you know, these are the rantings of somebody who has, you know, reaped the benefits and d- doesn't realize how much work there is to be done. And, and yeah, all but this. wouldn't and it I, be easier for you to just shut up and keep on? Well, yeah, and I and I guess, but like my my answer to that is, you know, I I yes, I am white and I'm a feminist, but really, I'm approaching this as somebody who has a certain sort of bullshit detector. Right. And that's not something exclusive to white people or anybody else. I mean, there are people I I, I hear from all sorts of people, people, you know, working in factories, people yeah. who are lawyers, people yep. who are waitresses, people, you know, all walks of life, all over the country, every ethnic background. And they're saying, uh, like, thank you. Like, yeah. this, like the, we're all feeling this. And the fact is, most people feel this way. Mm. And it's just not you know what is happening on twitter has outsized influence right it's a tiny number of people that have been handed an incredible amount of influence well i'm glad we've solved all the problems it's definitely solved (laughs) so at the end of every podcast i ask the same two questions what is your biggest defect of character or vice or whatever whatever you might be working through or on i am impatient Mm. i just get really um it's like if I decide that I want something to happen, if it doesn't happen right away. Were you like that as a kid? Yes. Yeah. Like I just get, like if I'm afraid it's going to go away or I'm going to miss the opportunity or yeah. something. I'm just like, I can't stand it. So yeah, I'm very impatient. And what is your greatest asset? Oh, that I can be alone. Mm, I um, love that. Yeah. I think, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make, like people screw up their lives for two reasons, because they think other people are going to change and because they can't be alone. Mm. And uh, I think it's helped me just in my, in my personal life in a lot of ways, but I, frankly, it's what enabled me to write this book. Like if I couldn't be alone, I would not be able to do this work and write this book Mm -hmm. and write the things that I write and say the things I'm saying these days, because it requires uh, a great deal of solitude Mm -hmm. and, and being able to tolerate, uh, not having anybody with you. Yeah. So I love those. I love that. And I love you. Oh, I love you too. I love your dog. She She knows to go for a walk now. She just knows she has the timing. She'll do. She's (laughs) always like you really even with ours. Yeah. She knows when it's like, okay, (laughs) it's time. She knows that people, no one's going to listen any further. She has a feeling. She has the, (laughs) yeah. She's like, okay, you guys have had enough time. So where can we find you? Oh, I am on Twitter oh at Megan underscore Dom and Megan has an H. So M-E-G-H-A-N underscore D-A-U-M. I am not on Instagram, although I've recently heard that there are a handful of Instagram accounts that are like fake accounts with my name and photo on them. So Ooh, if you see them, do not follow something. them. Do not follow those. Um, I don't know. You can go to my website, MeganDom.com and um, buy your book. Yeah. Yeah. Buy um, the book. Easily, it's so good. Easily findable. Thank I'm glad you. you wrote it. Thank you. I'm I was just tearing was, through it. Oh, thank and just you. Mo- a lot of it is just uh, like, oh, yes, yes, yes. And you just have so much insight. And I had to look up a bunch of words. Your, vocab- <laughs> your vocabulary yeah. is amazing. Sometimes they make up words, though. So no, that's... they were good words. I was like, oh, wow. I learned at least three new words. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so Nothing thank else. you for coming. Thank you, Bridget. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Right. For the love of God. I feel like we just did a check-in. We did just do a check-in like three days ago. Oh, jeepers. What do we have to talk about? Nothing. All we do is work. <laughs> That's all I do. Yep. Work and talk about work. And talk during work because work is also dumpster fire. And the podcast. <laughs> yep. So this week on the check-in, we are going to have five minutes of meditation. (laughs) Silent, (laughs) contemplative time. (laughs) Take this time. I'm going to lead you on a guided meditation, Maggie. Anyone else can join us. Take a deep breath in. I'm trying to get the entire internet to calm down. (laughs) Good luck to you, sir. At the same time that I'm trying to get them riled up. Uh Tonight on Twitter, I went after Bill Maher, so I probably won't be going on his show anytime soon. (laughs) Yep. We shot a dumpster fire today. 
It was really fun. <laughs> I lost It'll my be out. Sh- yeah, it'll be out. By when, the time this comes yeah, out. Yeah, that's right. By the time this comes out. I lost my shit at one point. <laughs> I was dying laughing so hard. Locals is amazing. Locals is amazing. Yeah, I, we don't have anything to talk about because all we do is work. It's an awesome platform. How's your love life, Maggie? <laughs> Non-existent, Bridget. Who do you want to win the Super Bowl by the time we air this so they will already have won? I am rooting for the 49ers because I love Jimmy G. I always will. Former Patriot. Love him. I'll always root for him, except against, you know, us. And yeah, I mean, the Chiefs are freaking amazing. I I hold them no ill will, but, you know, they're also in our conference. So I'd prefer the 49ers to win. I want the 49ers to, to win, too. Yep. It'll be a good game, no matter what. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so, too. I'll be flying. Oh, no, I'll land, You'll land in time. I'll be in Baltimore when this lands. Or D.C. If you're listening to this and you're my friend in D.C., I apologize for not telling you I'm here. (laughs) If you're listening to this and attempting to stalk Bridget, you now know exactly where she is. (laughs) I'm in D.C. Running around like a lunatic. I don't have anything interesting to say tonight. Well, we can keep this check-in short. It doesn't need to be long. (laughs) It's been a long day. We've still got some editing to do. We have so much to do. You're going to be gone this week, and then... I'm packing. Full throttle. I Can we talk about how much I hate packing? (laughs) Sure. Tell us how much you hate packing, Bridget. You would think I'd be good at it by now. You would. You should be good at it by now. But I hate it. It, it isn't that I'm bad at it, although I'm bad at it too. I often forget underwear. Uh-huh. I went to Vegas once and forgot underwear, and I was like, well. Well, that's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to forget underwear anywhere in the world, it might as well be Vegas. Yep. You would think, though. I just want to get to that level where I'm like Tony Robbins and all my clothes are numbered and someone else packs them for me. Wow. Tony Robbins, all his clothes are numbered. They all have little things sewed into them. Wow. And his, you know, all of his suits and everything. His assistant knows exactly what to pack. Yeah. Or he has different combos for different places that he's going. Right. Wow. When I tried to do his whole time management thing, I was like, I don't have time to sew things into my clothes, Tony. (laughs) That's what assistants are for. I have a pile of mail sitting here and it still makes me feel like a junkie when I have unopened mail. Yeah, I know. Me too. Well, it doesn't make me feel like a junkie, but it makes me it's feel like same, a loser. Yeah. Yeah. The depression rears, rearing its head. I'm yeah. like, Ugh. What's uh, funny is that it, it it's a it's such a symptom of addiction. Like you hear about it all the time in the rooms. They're just things that you hear from all people who have had drinking or using problems. Uh-huh. One is that going to the grocery store is really triggering for some reason. Really? Not just because of the alcohol in the grocery stores in California. But just there's something about the experience that makes people want to drink and use drugs. Is it because you have to make so many choices? Maybe. I don't know. It's a very common phenomenon. The fluorescent lights, uh-huh. the people. The people. Just the, the, I think it's like that. Um, you know, the uh, this is water. Yeah. The David Foster yeah, 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 Wallace. Yeah. It's funny that he chooses the grocery store. The grocery store, store as a setting. Yeah. yeah. Because that is where you're like, ah the humanity and i I mean i was reading this book about um the holocaust survivor his memoir that i interviewed actually yesterday we could talk about that too and he's so old and we were talking about this in the interview they were doing their wash in the river and washing their dishes in the river wow that's how it was not he was closer horses and carriages yeah he was closer to medieval times than he was to modern times wow. in the way that they lived. <laughs> I'm excited to listen to that one. He's just feisty. Yeah. And he lives pretty close to you, which is awesome. I you know. I'm their new chauffeur. He can't drive anymore. Oh. They were like, do you ever go to Costco? I was like, hey, I will for you. I, I can take you there. I was like, reluctantly. No, but he's so optimistic and, and grateful and yeah. still has such a good sense of humor and looks at everything so with such grace and love and that seems to be a common theme with all the survivors because I think you have to. Right. And like Ava says in her memoir that I'm reading, The Choice, which is she's also an Auschwitz survivor, is that 
if you choose cynicism and being jaded, you're essentially still allowing yourself to be imprisoned by your victimizers. Wow. And I don't know what kind of, you know, he's never done therapy. And it's like my friend who's also interviewed a lot of Holocaust survivors said, like, that's <laughs> that's above the pay grade. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, yeah. There are just some things that are between you and God. Yeah. And you just have to find your own peace with and yeah, reconcile somehow. He's just amazing. He's wow. so just, I can't wait for that, that one too. Yeah. I just feel so lucky. It's something that fell into my lap from a Twitter follower, Brent. He uh-huh. rec- he reached out to me and said, hey, I know this girl and his fa- her father is a Holocaust survivor. And then he happened to live like two blocks away, which in LA is also just a, a miracle. random miracle. <laughs> And I lo- I hung out and had coffee with uh, his- him and his wife afterwards. And wow. they're just so sweet. It was really fun and sad and moving and, you know, dark humor. And like, he's just, he was saying at one point, he's, I had him like dying laughing because he said something like, um, he said he'd never done therapy or something. And then he was saying that, you know, it was a miracle that he didn't do drugs and alcohol and then he said i wish i had done more you know and i was like drugs and alcohol and he started laughing <laughs> i knew what he meant he meant i think therapy but yeah it was really funny uh, it was amazing yeah i'm excited for that one i think we've exhausted all of our topics <laughs> all right well have a safe trip by the time you guys hear this she'll basically be back yeah, I'll be on my way. On to the next. Next, next, next. Any final words, Bridget? Try not to kill each other online, guys. I, I asked him, how do you fight hate, you know? And uh-huh. he said, with love. Wow. So simple. I know, but so hard. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs) 